On August 17, 1975, a mother called to report her son missing from their All Good Tennessee home. A massive search ensued, and eventually he was located. But it was not the ending anyone wanted. What happened to four-year-old Patrick Lewis? This is True Crime Out Loud. I'm your host, B. And I'm your host, Jen. And this week's case takes us to Putnam County, Tennessee. And this is kind of a special case for us because we are actually on location in Cookville, Tennessee, which is the county seat of Putnam County. The population in Cookville is about 31,000, and Cookville and its surrounding smaller towns create the Cookville Micropolitan Area. One of those smaller communities is where our case takes place in Allgood, Tennessee. Now, Allgood is located about 4.3 miles outside of Cookville and at the base of Allgood Mountain, and it's a small town. In 1970, the population was about 1,800, and in 2010, it was about 3,500. And it's only about four square miles of land with no bodies of water. And living in Allgood was a family of five. We have the mother, Laurel Norris Adams, who was 29. We have her husband, James Chester Adams, who was 35. And James Adams, most of his family was from Indianapolis, Indiana area. James had an eighth grade education, but he was a long haul truck driver. Living with them were three children. Lavana, who was five, and Patrick was four, were Laurel's children. And then there was Susan, who was two, and she was Laurel and James' child together. So James was the stepfather to Lavana and Patrick, but father to Susan. I just could not find as much information as I normally do on cases, and I researched it to the best of my ability. So this week it's going to be a little bit shorter than normal, but I think we got all the pertinent information covered. This case starts for us on Sunday, August 17th, 1975. Laurel Adams called the police to report her four-year-old son, Patrick Lewis, as missing. And she reported to the officers that he was last seen when her husband, his stepfather, James, was leaving for one of his truck runs at about 4.30 a.m., She said she believed that Patrick had wandered away from the home and was concerned. The police conducted a massive search for Patrick that lasted two days and into a third day, but it came to an end on that third day when a hitchhiker found the naked, beaten body of Patrick Lewis in Pickett County, Tennessee. And Pickett County is about 30 miles from Patrick's home. So now we're going to kind of move into the autopsy and what we know happened to Patrick. Was it accidental or was it homicidal or or exactly what, what went on? What we learn is that he died as a result of a severe beating. He had massive skull fractures, broken jaw, broken nose, torn ear, torn lip. And there were jagged fractures in the bones, in the eye orbits. And I saw two different news articles. One said that those shards of bone had perforated both of his eyeballs. And others said that he had perforations to his eyeballs that looked like they could have been caused possibly by a fork or some type of sharp tool. There was also severe injury to his scrotum and penis area that most likely came from a massive kick to the growing area. And it had to be an extremely severe beating, according to the medical examiner, because children's bones are more pliable and flexible than than adults. And for him to have so many broken bones, it had to be really, really severe. So who's the first people they talk to? Obviously, it's going to be the parents in any case like this. The parents are where the police start the investigation, and they did in this case. Laurel and James were offered several polygraphs, 
but they refused to take them. So the police department obviously conducted a search of the home. They removed moldings, wood chips, mattress covers, and a few other items that they located in the home that were stained with blood. They searched James's truck and found a pillowcase stained with blood, but they were unable to type match it. You got to remember, this is the 1970s. So DNA technology and all that is not what it is today. Yeah, DNA wasn't even a word then. They could type match, but I think that was as much identification they could do on blood. Yeah, yeah. So they talked to Laurel and James, and eventually Laurel tells them a story of what happened. She said the kids got up around 9 or 10 on the morning of Saturday, August 16th, 1975. James got up about 1.30, and he demanded that Laurel cook him breakfast. James wanted everybody gathered around the table while he ate. While they were sitting at the table, Patrick threw up, and this made James angry. So he slapped Patrick, then he punches him in the face, and Patrick falls to the floor, bleeding. So James orders Laurel to take Patrick to the bathroom and wash the blood off of him which she did. They returned back to the kitchen and James started beating Patrick again, this time because he was crying. He knocked him to the floor where he punched him and kicked him repeatedly and said to him, get up little bastard or I'll kill you. And then he continued to beat him until he died. Now, Laurel said she walked out when the beating began But later, she wrapped Patrick's body so that James could dispose of him. And James took Patrick's body with him when he left for this truck run and dumped him over a hillside in Pickett County. She said the the only reason was James was angry at Patrick and jealous of Patrick. Well, as you might have guessed, the police then speak with James and he's going to have a different story. That shouldn't come as a shock to anybody. He admitted to helping dispose of Patrick's body, but he did deny that the body was left where it was found. He told police that he believed somebody, most likely Laurel, followed him there and moved the body. James's story, like we commonly see in these type situations, puts all of the blame on Laurel. He said Laurel is the one who beat and killed Patrick. Patrick got sick at the table, so Laurel jerked him out of the chair pulling him across the table and threw him on the floor and then began repeatedly kicking him. James said that he helped dispose of Patrick because he loved his wife and didn't want her to go to jail. So initially, Laurel is charged with accessory after the fact. She agrees to testify against James and wasn't promised anything or any deals for her testimony. So James is going to be charged with the murder, obviously, because Laurel was charged with accessory after the fact. Now, the medical examiner stated that he didn't feel that Laurel was capable of inflicting the amount of damage to Patrick that he saw because of her size, although James did have the physical size to inflict that type of damage. James was six foot two and 210 pounds. This case was really tough on the investigators, and they said that they became physically sick when they saw the injuries inflicted on Patrick. Now, James had been charged with beating Patrick on three other occasions in Indiana and Cumberland County, Tennessee. So this family has a history of domestic violence, obviously. He had served six months for reckless homicide in the death of his former wife in Indiana. Both James and Laurel testified that during the beating, Patrick said, Daddy, I love you. So, I mean, it's just horrible. In 1976, James was convicted a first-degree murder and sentenced to die in the electric chair. The jury had a difficult time determining whether or not this crime was premeditated. You know, we talked about it happened at the breakfast table and all of that. But one juror reported that after it came to light, that after the initial beating, Patrick was cleaned up and then James began beating him again, they determined it was premeditated. And James Chester Adams was scheduled to die March 4th, 1977. Now, Laurel, after James's trial, her charges were changed to aiding and abetting. 
She had a hard time getting an attorney because of the horrific nature of the crime. No one really wanted to take her case. One attorney said that he couldn't even read a news article about it without getting sick. Laurel eventually took a plea deal where she was sentenced to 10 years, where she served a portion of that time. We got some things to discuss about this after the case, because James filed an appeal and there were some other Supreme Court decisions In 1977, which James was scheduled to die in 1977, but the death sentence was commuted to a life sentence versus a death sentence. In 1978 is when his appeal finally hits the courts, and that's what we're going to talk about. The, The appeal of James came to the courts in 1978, and there were a few points on that, and I'm just going to tell you what they are. One point we're going to discuss a little bit further in detail. So the points of the appeal, the first was that he was denied change of venue, which was requested due to his pretrial publicity. So the second point is the testimony of his wife was in violation of the privilege regarding confidential and marital communications. The third point was the photos of the partially decomposed body of Patrick that were admitted into the trial. And then the fourth point on his appeal was the constitutionality of the death penalty, But they rendered that moot because even though it didn't come before the court in 1978, by that point, his death sentence had already been commuted. As I said, we are on location in Cookville, Tennessee, which is the county seat of Putnam County, as I mentioned. And we have a special guest, the first guest on any True Crime Out Loud podcast. And that is going to be our resident legal analyst, MJ. Okay, so MJ, what I want to discuss with you, first of all, is why was his death sentence commuted to a life sentence? Yes, in the early 1970s, the U.S. Supreme Court struck down the death penalty. Okay, so it, it was a it was an all-over thing. It was more of a response to a federal decision, and uh, obviously the highest court in the land struck down the death penalty as unconstitutional in the early 1970s, and the governor of Tennessee commuted Mr. Adams' sentence from uh, electrocution to life without parole. Okay, okay. And so that made it a boot point. The court's not going to consider a point that's already been settled. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, the next thing, um, point one of his appeal was the change of venue. And what they basically said is there was a lengthy jury selection, and the judge took great care in his oversight of the jury selection. They said jurors don't have to be ignorant of the facts, but they have to show proof that the publicity caused him an unfair trial. Mm. And they said the defense accepted this jury without exhausting their peremptory challenges. Yes, thank you. I cannot say that word. In any trial, civil or criminal, either side, both sides, get an opportunity to interview jurors. It's a process called voir dire. And you ask jurors questions if they have any biases or prejudice toward the basis of the case, whether it's civil or criminal, or toward the defendant or plaintiff themselves. And each side gets a number of challenges, and these are called preemptory challenges. In this case, at the time, the uh, defense attorney had 16 preemptory challenges. He only used four, according to the decision in State versus Adams. And the court said, you cannot fail to use your preemptory challenges and then later on cry foul to the amount uh, to the prejudice of the jurors when you did not... Uh, investigate that option in the first place. You have to kind of take your opportunity at the time. And then if something's found later that's negative and you've done all of your due diligence as a defense counsel, then you can argue more successfully at that time. Okay, okay. So the next point is the photos. So the judge actually only allowed four black and white photos into the trial that showed the location and condition of the body. And they said he even excluded a color photo of the victim and photos taken during autopsy. Now photos or the photos that were entered were relevant to establish the severity of the wounds and the hiding and disposal of Patrick's body. Why are photos an issue in trial? Generally in Tennessee, gruesome photos, a general rule is it allowed, is it allowed in a, in a trial Now, you have the general rule, but you have exceptions to that general rule. And in this matter, the judge did indeed exclude gruesome color photographs of the boy's body and the autopsy uh, pictures taken by the uh, coroner. 
the point is we've got a rule of evidence, Tennessee Rule 403, and just to be just to sum it up, Rule 403 basically says that relevant evidence that is probative, which means it relates to the case, can be excluded if, if unfair prejudice outweighs its value. So if it inflames, if it initially inflames the minds of the potential jurors. In this matter, let's give you an example. Uh, you can still include a photograph of a corpse or, dis- or, or injuries to a corpse or injuries to a victim that survives in a criminal case that doesn't involve death. But let's say, for example, those injuries can be better explained by a coroner or the medical examiner. The court's going to default to the medical examiner to accurately explain the injuries to the corpse or to the person. And it gets the jury the same idea, basically. They don't have to see the photographs. They don't, they're not inflamed, but they do get the true testimony from the medical examiner, for example, that, you know, this person was murdered. He received injuries to this part of his body or that part of her body. So gruesome photographs are let in, but if they're too gruesome and if there's an alternate explanation or if they don't relate to the case, sometimes they don't relate to the case. Yeah, and uh, so the the whole point is not to inflame a jury exactly. to say to say, "Hey, this guy killed this child." It might not have been premeditated, but these photos, looking at what he did to this child, we're going to go ahead and give him the death penalty. So something along those lines is they they don't want the photos to have shock value. The jurors are human beings. Yeah. And they have emotions just like all of us, and they're going to see a photo. Uh they're going to say, "I'm going to stick it to this guy." Yeah. Uh, and so that's why the rules in place in the it's at the judge's discretion usually uh whether he he or she will allow the photos in and again if the probative value is outweighed by the unfair prejudice to inflame the jurors then usually he or she will disallow the photos into evidence okay okay so the next point was the marital privilege and this was from my reading and my research this was a landmark ruling by judge leon burns jr in that a wife could be forced to testify against her husband. I want you to explain that because that is such murky waters. And I have people ask me, even though I'm, I'm not an attorney, it's just the law enforcement background, they want to know about marital privilege. And we also see cases in domestic violence or different things. People will get married right before it goes to court thinking that's going to protect them. I want mm-hmm. you to, to explain to us the marital privilege in 1975 when this this occurred and then marital privilege up to date. Well, spousal privilege is, is a more common term. But even in 1975, it was uh, there was no definitive exception for child abuse. And a marital privilege protects all communication between spouses. There are some exceptions to those. First of all, if or they commit a crime against each other, obviously the privilege does not apply. And also if there's child abuse... The privilege does not apply. Uh, if they're, say, parents and they both have care over this child, over the family unit, and the child is abused, obviously the husband telling the wife, don't say anything about this, will not apply. So n- before 1975, there was no clear cut exception to child abuse as a marital privilege. So I guess shortly before this case, the Tennessee legislature passed a statute which basically defined child abuse. And the court took the statute from the, the previous uh, previous passage and crafted it onto this decision that as of that date, 1978, child abuse was no longer uh, protected under the marital privilege or spousal privilege communications. Uh, so you cannot refuse to testify against your husband or your spouse if child abuse was involved. And it's been that way to this day. Uh, the marital privilege has evolved. As a matter of fact, I believe in New Mexico, 2019, they almost successfully eliminated it entirely. And then a court bought it back later that year. So, as I said, and also, if you're not married anymore, the exceptions do not apply. Okay. Okay. So, so basically... This case was a horrific case of child abuse, and this little Patrick Lewis died. 
but it ended up being able to protect children in the future because of the domestic violence and being able to testify against your spouse. Yes, yes, there's no privilege. Uh, the, the state and the court stated that the state has a much more compelling interest in protecting the health and welfare of a child than honoring a marital privilege or spousal privilege in this instance. This, Like I said, it's a horrific case, but to know that this child did not die in vain, that something did come out of this that's going to protect or has protected future children, is it, it gives me a, a sense of, okay, this world isn't going to yes. crap. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. It's, it's certainly, you know, it certainly helped future cases, uh, subsequent cases, where this was involved, and they couldn't hide behind that privilege um, in order to try to cover up their abuse of a child. Thank you, MJ, for joining us and breaking down the law for us and making us understand it in in what I call normal people terms. (laughs) Thank you. So after the case, all the appeals were denied, and James came up for a parole hearing in September of 1997, and he claimed it was not on purpose but the death of Patrick was an accident. He said he drank over a fifth of Jack Daniels and had taken 10 or 12 hits of speed prior to the murder. And he really did not remember the details of what happened. Now, Patrick's sister, Lavana, who was five at the time of his death, testified that Patrick could not understand why the man he saw as his father was targeting him and beating him. She also said that she had endured abuse from James. She told the court that James would sometimes hold their heads under water. And the one thing that she said that struck me was, James is a bad, bad man who should have been put to death. And I can't say I disagree with that. But all I could find about James, I checked Tennessee Department of Corrections, is that he is now deceased. Well, I think this... This parole hearing is one of these things that that really kind of gripes me personally. I can't stand when people hide behind things like this statement that he made. Oh, it wasn't on purpose. It was an accident. Oh, I drank a fifth of Jack Daniels and I'd taken a bunch of drugs. Well, guess what? Not only is that not a valid reason to do what you did, but it's excuses. It's just a refusal to accept any kind of personal responsibility. No wonder the parole board didn't grant this. It just bothers me that this guy tried to make these excuses to cover for what was obviously a history of domestic violence and abuse of these children. I'm sure that Lavelle was probably abused also. I mean, it sounds like this guy abused everybody, and I have to agree with Lavana that some people just deserve what they end up getting you know yeah and and like I said I couldn't find the the details of his death but the department Tennessee Department of Corrections shows that he's now deceased so that's that's where we know and that's where we're going to end and this case although it's hard to hear it's always about remembering these victims and that Patrick Lewis died a horrible tragic death but he will always be remembered, and his death is now protecting other children. Certainly, certainly. And while this was a tough case to cover, I did enjoy being on on site and visiting some of these places. It was a very interesting case from that aspect. I have enjoyed visiting the city of Cookville and kind of looking around Putnam County. It, it's been a neat experience. I wanted to share some some news. We've been getting so many requests for cases people want us to cover. And starting with next week, we're going to start covering those cases that are requested. And so you may hear your case come up. And, and we're kind of excited about that, that we've got the volume that we can do that now. And we are currently not only in the United States, but we are happy to announce that we have been downloaded in 29 countries. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, yeah. A lot faster than what we expected for people to be listening to our podcast. A special thank you to MJ for participating this week. And as always, we hope you enjoyed the podcast and we will see you next week. 
we would like to hear your thoughts on this and all of our cases. And as always, you can reach us by email at truecrimeoutloud at gmail.com, Facebook and Instagram at truecrimeoutloud. Outloud is two words, not one, and Twitter at TC Outloud. Photos, links, and sources for this case can be found on our website at www.truecrimeoutloud.com. 